so a very uh, good evening to all of you good evening good afternoon uh, depending on where you're joining us from uh, i'm sarthak bakchi and it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, to welcome you to this seminar and lecture series uh, event today um, today we are actually very um, delighted to have this interesting conversation around a book which has been i think making a lot of waves and making a lot of news um, in a very positive uh, manner of course and uh, so yeah so and uh, it's um, as much uh, like for the for the subject uh, and also for the for some part of the uh, subject of the book it's it's also gaining a lot of popular attention um, and what we are doing going to do uh, attempt to going to um, do in this conversation is to break down and look at the book uh, in in a more nuanced way uh, to do that um, as part of this seminar and lecture series event uh, we have the author uh, of this book um, dr shayana bhattacharya with us i'm not doctor okay. i'm not hi i'm not doctor okay uh, very touchy issue <laughs> So Shreyana Bhattacharya is trained in uh, development economics at the Delhi University and at Harvard University. Uh, and since 2014, in her role as an economist in the World Bank, uh, she has focused on issues related to social policy and jobs. Uh, prior to this, she has worked on research projects with the Center for Policy Research, with SEVA, um, and the Institute of Social, Science, uh, Social Studies Trust. Her writing has also appeared in Indian Express, EPW, Indian Quarterly, and the Caravan. Um, she will be in conversation today with uh, Dr. Leah Matthew, Assistant Professor at the School of Arts and Sciences. And they will be discussing uh, Dr. Uh, Shayana's new book, uh, Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh Khan, uh, Shah Rukh, sorry, uh, which is published by HarperCollins. Through the figure of Shah Rukh Khan, her book offers, which is, where, which is why you can assume that the popularity of the book is also emerging from. Uh, through the figure of Shah Rukh Khan, her book offers a complex portrait of female desire not just for romantic love, but also for independence, for self-worth and respectful familial relationships. In this book, uh, Shayana Bhattacharya maps the economic and personal trajectories, the jobs, desires, prayers, love affairs, and rivalries of a diverse group of women, divided by class, but united in fandom. They remain steadfast in their search for intimacy, independence, and fun. Uh, while reading the reviews of the book, it actually reminded me of... Uh, this uh, small vignette uh, from a course that I taught last semester, which was on qualitative field research. And uh, with some students uh, to do some field research, we were actually in one of the uh, one of these riverfront parks in Ahmedabad. And uh, we encountered this group of women. Uh, some of the students who have taken the course will remember this. We encountered this group of women who were actually coming from different backgrounds and different uh, geographical zones of the city. And they were basically, they had this, kind of a group amongst them of having fun and having this kind of seeking this kind of in, uh, independence, seeking this kind of intimacy uh, in a zone which is outside of their regular everyday life and regular, you know, gender defined roles. Uh, and it was so exhilarating to even talk to them and get to know about their purpose of being uh, there at, at that point in that in that park. Uh, and I wish uh, somebody could could have done more research at that point I was wishing and then we saw like this kind of very systemic analysis of uh, of that kind of seekingness uh, coming in in the form of this wonderful book. So, without much uh, ado, I would um, now invite our dean uh, of School of Arts and Sciences, uh, Professor Patrick French, to say a few words. And after that, I'll hand it over to Leah Matthew. Patrick, over to you. Well, that's very uh, kind of you, uh, Satak, to introduce me, and thanks everybody for attending in person and online. Um, we're very happy to be holding today's event, and I was not intending to speak, merely to say hello, so I'll hand over directly to Leia. Thank you. Leia? Welcome again, and thank you so much for joining us. I'll begin with a couple of process questions. So um, I tried to sort of put together a timeline from the book and uh, I, you know, I'm sure you'll flesh it out in much greater detail. The earliest I could find was 2006 when as a master's student, you are participating in surveys. In 2007, again, you're with ISST with surveys again. 
2008-9, you are uh, doing a survey of domestic workers in Delhi. 2008, you meet one of the main characters, Gold, at a club. Uh, 2016, you met Vidya, another um, central character at a matinee screening. So this is across, you write, uh, about 15 years. So how has this developed? You write that this is research that began unknowingly. So how did this develop first as an idea which then became coherent and then into a sort of independent research project? Because you write from 2013 to 17, you were doing more focused sessions. And then finally, as a book for publication. Gosh, well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Ahmedabad is actually the city where this book began. It's very, actually, it's quite emotional for me to be back. And some people who were just chatting with me before got a hint of how emotional I can get about being here. Um, you know, Leah, I have to confess that this book is a product of a complete a series of accidents. Um, I, if I were to try and uh, claim that, you know, I had some grand design in mind, and I think just picking up from what, you know, he was saying earlier about this was a qualitative research method, and I thought it through, I'd be lying. That's not true. Um, it, it was an accident. Uh, what happened was I was working with the Institute of Social Studies Trust. Uh, as, uh, in fact, a colleague of mine is here. She's a faculty member here. It's so lovely to see her. And um, I was sent to a neighborhood nearby Bapu Nagar uh, in an area which is called Agarbatti Colony. And I was supposed to be doing a survey of women who were uh, making garments and incense sticks at home, earning about a quarter of minimum wage. And it was supposed to be a very traditional survey. Uh, how many people here have administered a survey questionnaire, a quantitative survey questionnaire? Just raise your hands just so that I have a... Okay, that's, a, that's actually a sizable group. So you know that it can actually be a very frustrating process, right? Because you start to ask questions. And as social scientists, I feel we are often trained to only almost narrow down, particularly when you're collecting quantitative data, to narrow down a person's responses to fit your very rigid framework, right? So I was there to do a survey on wages, working conditions, hours of work. That is what I was supposed to elicit from these women I was speaking with. And it became very clear to me that this was not what they were interested in answering at all, because they were all actively unionizing. Uh, most of them, as I mentioned in the book, were members of SEVA. Um, they were acutely aware of their own economic deprivations. They were acutely aware of their own uh, challenges when it came to labor power, rights, voice. And they were actively unionizing to fight with their employers to actually push for more wages. Um, and there was a tripartite board. And in fact, anyone who's interested can study the history of tobacco workers' activism, as well as incense stick workers' activism, uh, garment workers' activism, home-based workers in Ahmedabad. It's a really interesting story and, and a lot of it is available. Um, I'd encourage people to go look through that. So these women were part of that movement. And suddenly they saw another girl wearing a khadi gurta with kajal in her eyes, asking the same questions that they have answered for themselves because they had actually done a survey on themselves, on their own wages and working conditions. And I remember one of them actually turned to me and she said, well, we presented this data to the government and nothing happened. So what is the point, right? And it was a, so th these are, I think, very... These are somewhat banal frustrations actually in social science research. I think anyone who does a survey will hit this kind of uh, resistance when you go to the field, uh, provided you're actually aware of it and you pay attention to it and you care to pay attention to it, which I know some who don't perhaps. Uh, and I was very aware of it. And I did not want the women I was speaking to, I was very young, I was in my early 20s. I did not want these women to be bored of my questions. And it was so obvious that there was NY, eye rolls, all of that. So to ease things up, I think many of us know we use icebreakers, right? And, and I call it a research recess in the book. So we just took a break. And then, you know, in our country, there are very few things that unite people in conversation. I didn't want to talk to people about politics. Uh, I'm not interested in cricket. Um, I thought, let's just talk about Bollywood. So I asked people, I asked these women, who is your favorite actor? And, you know, uh, she's laughing because, in fact, uh, colleague, she knows, she actually saw me during this process. So it's actually quite remarkable that I'm here and she's sitting right here. Um, and I came back, I remember, oh, I met Shah Rukh fans everywhere. And these women, I mean, not everyone was a Shah Rukh fan, but most were Shah Rukh fans. And I'm a giant Shah Rukh Khan fan. And what was fascinating to me, Leah, was I 
pick this up very early between that period of 2006 to 2007 in this city that when you started to talk about Mr Khan these women were not talking about him they were talking about themselves they were talking about how difficult it was for them to access markets uh, to actually be able to enjoy leisure Uh, because leisure is a is a it's a transaction right you have to purchase leisure in the economy that we have built uh, they were talking about how hard it was for women to find safe inclusive spaces to just have fun right uh, they were talking about how difficult it was to have independent purchasing power they were also talking about how difficult it was for women to not feel guilty about just claiming their own pleasure and their own fun and as i started to listen to these conversations and because the texture had just opened up i think as a young exhilarated kid and i think it's similar to the exhilaration that you know you were talking about um just as you know when we were introducing us um i realized that i wanted to follow through and i had no design in mind what i did have is a few people who were very curious about why i wanted to talk to them about sharukh khan they were not interested in talking to me about labor conditions they were happy to talk about sharukh and i said fine let's let's try this and i then tried the same technique in a way just as an ice breaker because it was required when i was working for a project with professor nitya rao who is an anthropologist who studies uh, a specific area in jharkhand looks at adivasi communities in the santhal pargana area again i'd highly encourage all of you who are interested in these issues to look up look up her work um i was working with her as a research assistant when she was doing an ethnography on uh, migrant domestic workers who were moving out of jharkhand moving to delhi and um again i met a few women not as many as i did in the more urban contexts that i inhabited which is not that surprising and i decided that i had almost started forming this informal fan club right who all these women who just seemed to love this man but they were never actually talking about him they were talking about markets media and as leia the conversation started to develop um one trend i noticed uh, when i would i'm a diligent note taker uh, i'm quite you know i journal i write i write most conversations down uh i i realized that one of the things that happened was they were no longer just talking about markets and media suddenly they started talking about men and masculinity as well because it just i think around the fourth year of this exercise uh and and i think you get a flavor of that in the book you know manju's considering marriage there's a character in the book uh in rural up and suddenly they started using the icon of mr khan to start to critique models of masculinity in their real life and that became even more interesting and at that stage the one decision i did have to make though is you know all of these women i'd met through research projects that contended with their own ethical norms right anyone who does qualitative research knows that you go through certain human subject reviews you have to be very careful about what protocols you use so i told the people i was working with at isst i told professor rao that look this is what i'm thinking of doing what do you think uh, initially i think i met um, some resistance because they said well you know this sounds like a mad project and the one piece of advice i did get as i was going through the sort of process of getting the reviews getting the clearances making sure i had a practice in place to protect anonymity make sure that everyone was comfortable transcribing translating because you have to send the conversations back it's a lot of effort um as i was doing that i remember dr ratna sudarshan who was at that time the head of the institute of social studies trust and my boss she said this one thing to me which has always stayed with me she said never ask questions that you would not be willing to answer for yourself and i decided at that time that i would follow these women but i would never ask direct questions about tell me about your economic freedoms you know there's a way traditionally social scientists are taught to ask these questions i i wasn't interested that didn't that project doesn't excite me i thought i would only ask about sharukh and i had this instinct based on the early rounds of the years of conversation that this would go somewhere i had no idea it would go where it has gone to be honest and sometime in 2013 2012 2013 by then i had met there's a character in fact called the accountant who's a delhi uh, account service officer in the book who i met during the time i just started working for the world bank but at that time i was actually working for the delhi government because you know the world bank often brings in consultants and then you get embedded in government so i was at delhi government at that time so i met her then and i met gold at a night club and i decided around 2012 that i would open it up to include the stories of gold and accountant as well i sought their permission there were lots of issues about what went in what didn't go in and then we just kept chatting once they were comfortable 
But in 2012, the other thing that happened 2012 to 2013 is that I had my own heart smashed. I had a terrible relationship, which I'm very transparent about in the book. And, you know, I went back to what Ratna had said to me about don't ask of others what you will not place of yourself in a text. And I decided if I was writing about other people's marriages and heartbreak and all of that, where was I in this text? And there was something quite seminal, I think, happening to just my cognitive makeup, right? When I thought about men and singledom and feminism and being a, and womanhood. And so I decided in 2013 that I would no longer keep this as a book just about women in India's precariat or the emerging middle class, that I would open it up. I would open it up to include myself. I would open it up to include women who are upper caste, who are elite. Uh, and often, in fact, studying the elites, I, I think many of us who do social science here will know studying the elites is actually one of the most difficult things you can do. Um, and I faced that because there were more challenges when it came to women from uh, low income communities or this emerging middle class, there were standard research protocols that I could follow. And as long as they were comfortable and the organizations affiliated were comfortable, I was somewhat okay. But when it came to women who were English speaking, there were so much fears about identification. Delhi is a very small place. People will read it. My ex-boyfriend had to receive the document because he had to see how he was being written. Lots of stuff happened. And I think at that time, to be honestly, at that time, I just, I think I just grew in conviction as I went through this process that I was going to write it this way, that it would be much more personal. It would not be an academic text where there was some distant observer and, you know, looking at a set of women from afar, that I would be far more present while it would not be my story, it would be theirs, but I had to be present. Uh, and the other thing I had to do then was as I opened it up to upper caste women, Vidya was one of the only ones who actually was comfortable along with someone called the Rajput philosopher in the book, um, who were comfortable being identified. Everyone else said, no, 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 you know, you have to like you, you change it. And so I, what I did was I spoke to a bunch of women and I created a median. All of us know how to create a median. And I wrote up the median. And so that chapter is called the elite composite. So what you actually see is, you know, in market research, they do this a lot. You just write up the median consumer. So I wrote up the median upper caste uh, elite uh, Shah Rukh Khan fan because there were so many issues about all, you know, uh, this is getting at end. It was becoming too, it was just too difficult to do this, which I thought, which I think now looking back is really interesting, right? Like how difficult it is to study the elite. Um, and to do it well and to do it rigorously. Um, and there's actually, I mean, there is literature, I think it's particularly in the qualitative social sciences that seems to allude to this. And so I just followed up. So between 2013, I went back between 2013 to 2014. I went back and I changed the tone tenor of the text completely. It was no longer now going to be just a somewhat academic feminist text. It was going to be written in the style of a travelogue almost. And I wanted it to be much more personal. I wanted the economics to be really alive. I, I had this thing that the book's text should be as alive as a Shah Rukh Khan film. Like it should feel like you are, you know, you're present and it's sort of moving, right? I didn't want, I, and I wrote it for my grandmother who passed away around that time. And, you know, she, she used to always say to me, like, what are these papers? They're so boring. I read them and I just want to fall asleep. Uh, academic texts. And so I decided, well, if I wanted to tell my grandmother and Shah Rukh Khan what was happening to women in the economy, how would I present these statistics? How would I write it up? So I think that was a principle that I started to almost cultivate in that 2013-14 period. Uh, in 2016, I met Vidya, I met a few other people who are in the text. And the book was supposed to finish around 2019. Um, but then the pandemic struck. And I could not, you know, it needed to be bookended at the pandemic. I just felt that that needed to happen. So I wrote some more. I followed up a little bit more, whatever was possible, whatever people were comfortable sharing. And that is the text. So it's 15 years of following a subset of women and then five years of following a set of elite women and a composite of those. So it's lots of voices. The mad thing that I did sometime, I think in 2018, which I don't think you mentioned, but I, I now when I think about it, I think it was quite mad, is I decided that I would, uh, not only was I obviously typing all of this up and sending it back to people, because many times people can't read English, they're not even reading Hindi, you have to narrate it. So I have like full film style narration of the, of the text of the chapter. So I was joking with someone recently that it's ready to be OTT at any stage because, you know, that was the way we had, we had almost, you know, discussed it when I was going through the ethical norms of how you elicit the data and capture it. And uh, the other thing I decided at that time was I would interview activists and scholars. 
I don't know what possessed me and I wanted to interview people who were in the film business because I think what I felt was I was so biased myself. I was such an angry young woman at that time uh, about what was happening to these women in my own life, the women around me, that I felt like I needed other people to sort of temper my anger. Of course, the funny thing is the people I interviewed and the anger was actually completely echoed, which is really interesting. It's right at the end. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was I realized I was so biased when it came to Mr. Khan that I needed to talk to other people because, you know, it couldn't just be me gushing constantly about it. And that would be boring. So I interviewed film producers, people like Siddharth Roy Kapoor in the book and Anupama Chopra, Mayank Shekhar, Rajasan, lots of film critics who just were so generous with their time because they didn't know me. I was cold calling people completely. Um, but people are generous and they thought this idea was so insane that they said, how can we not participate in it? Um, and everybody loves Shah Rukh. I think that's something that I realize is like a theme that runs through. Um, and so that was the book. Um, and one thing I have to say is that the text evolves significantly between 2019 till around 2021, which is the final version that you saw, which was released in November thanks to two people. Uh, one is my agent, but she's very much who I call my PhD guide in this book. Her name is Shruti Devi. She really took the text and just, you know, shaped it. And, you know, we fought a lot, but I usually used to agree with most of her edits and they're very helpful. When she asked me to go back to one of the women to collect something additional, I did it. I tried. Um, and the other person was Shogat Das Gupta, who was my editor at HarperCollins, who's been so generous with, again, what he did with the text. And so, then this is the text in 2021. And but the one thing I do want all of you to know here is that anyone, I mean, I'm not claiming at all that this was some grand thought out research plan. It was like I was living life and I was writing journals through life and I was reading academic literature and what was happening to women in the economy. And it's not surprising, given the kind of patriarchy our lives are steeped in, that the literature that is in academic in academia resonates so much with everything that I was seeing around me in these women's lives in my life that I, I think I was just fortunate because of my training in economics that I was able to make those connections. Um, and then my challenge was just to write it not in the way an economist would write it, uh, to write it in a way which was a, a lot more filmy perhaps and a lot more alive without sacrificing the rigor. Um, and yeah, that's, I know it's a very long answer, but it, it took a very long time and, and there were lots of considerations and there were people who were supposed to be in the book and at the last minute they said, we're not comfortable. And then all of that had to go. Uh, I had to kill many darlings and that was quite hard, but you have to, you have to adhere to those, those protocols. And that's the text right now. Right, so one of the uh, brilliant, you know, things about the book is that it actually gets people to read. It's like what happened with Harry Potter. You know, they said that school kids are not reading and suddenly Harry Potter came and everybody's reading. And what your book does is, we struggle, you know, to get students in our classes to read, like the oh academic. Gosh, what's going on? <laughs> that you say, uh, you know, it, it is, it's not easy. The English is difficult. There may be interesting ideas there, but definitely it's not easy for anybody. And to get people to actually start and finish a book itself is amazing. Right. So congratulations again. A follow-up question. I, I know believe we're actually clapping. We, this is the state of the written word. We're clapping that people are starting and reading books. I mean, I think let's take a minute to just acknowledge where we are. But yes, thank you. I'm very pleased. Please gift it to an alpha male. Everyone should gift it to an alpha toxic <laughs> male that they know. That is like, I think that is what must be done. Huh? A follow-up question. Uh, you've alluded to some of it already, but in terms of the writing, um, what were your drafts like? Did it change a lot? And, you know, what were some of the things uh, initially, how did you organize it? Yeah. Because you said this is not about economics, but the organization is very much about gender and mm. labor. Mm. So it is definitely about that. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, did you re have to reorganize? Yeah. If you could tell us something about that. So I maintained, uh, if you come to my house in Nizamuddin and provided, well, some of it I can't show you, but some of it I can show you you see that basically there's an entire shelf. It's a large shelf, which basically has uh, one woman. It's like an entire desk drawer that's dedicated to notes on conversations from... So, And each one actually has their own because 
I'm a big believer. The one thing about me, and maybe this is my personality type, it's also perhaps my training. I feel like I forget things very quickly and I never used only in interviews outside Mannat. Uh, my interviews with Vidya, uh, my interviews with the Rajput philosopher and a few other women, I used constant recording devices. Many of the other conversations were off the cuff. So we were on the phone, something happened, someone would call me, for example, Zahira, who's from Ahmedabad, now is in Surat. She needed help with her daughter's job. So she called me and then we were just generally chatting. And so one of the things I almost, I made a, I, I did quite diligently. And as a result, I've had no social life is that I used to just write everything down. I mean, everything. And so the first thing I did was I just, it was like raw material of just what was happening. I have a way of doing it, which I think different people use. So I use shapes to identify certain themes. So if there was something around care labor, there'd always be a triangle. So that's the way I sort of coded it in my own, just for my own self. And I was the only one who could understand it. No one else could. And the other thing I did layer. So as I kept these texts, each time I would immediately within the week, one of the things I was doing, especially for the women, there were three women who really said, we'll we are agreed to be part of this for the long haul who are part of these research projects that I was from, from ISST with Seva and others. I was obligated based on rules to just transcribe, translate and immediately send it to them. And if they said no or something was wrong, then it would go. And as you know, people don't have time. So often it would require, you know, I'd have to go visit I have the luxury of having a day job that allows me the privileges to take a flight and go or take a train and go. And, you know, I have the privilege of being able to waste time, if that makes sense. Right. And I can go and constantly follow up with people because this was not possible for them. And um, and so, yeah, I, I used my privilege in that sense. And what I basically did was I would I would try at least that within the month, if not within the week, that the person involved knew that this is what I was thinking and that, you know, would it be okay? And then of course, the funny thing is all of that changed when I finally wrote it, because, you know, when lives evolve, what you think you're about to write at that certain time, and you look at something when you're 26, and then you look at the same thing when you're 36, it changes. And in fact, it's changed even for the women who are participating in it, because they saw what was being written very differently. And so I had to reflect that. Um, so it was a very conversation heavy process, uh, which I don't mind because I'm generally silent in other parts of my life. Um, and the other thing that um, I, I felt really helped me was that I kept an Excel file. I mean, this is like very banal and old school. I kept an Excel file anytime the new NFHS or the PLFS, any of the data sets would come out, I would quickly analyze, I would keep like the median statistics, all the references. I have an Excel file, which essentially tracks women's employment from 1911 all the way now, which is in the book. Parts of the summary statistics are in the book at the very end. But I needed to do that. Otherwise, you know, later, uh, I was very fortunate at HarperCollins. We had a copy editor who was very particular about checking the numbers, making sure the references were okay. Um, and so I, I think I also have a personality, as I mentioned, which is a bit, I'm a bit difficult about these things. So I used to keep record. And I think it was eventually these two that came together. Um, yeah, but this is very much, I want to just say, this is very much a product of generosity because if the women who were involved in this project or other people who were giving me their data, there are lots of economists I thank in the book because they were able to explain, share, you know, there was a lot. Um, so it really is to me, you know, yes, I'm the author, but to me, it is such a collaborative process. Um, and I'm hoping I don't know in the future that I can sort of do something that rewards that kind of collaboration. Let's see, inshallah. A last follow-up question on process. Um, so you have what looks for us, uh, you know, we are very envious of the kind of intellectual community and a very interdisciplinary yeah. intellectual community that you have thanked in the acknowledgements. Yeah. How did that shape your thinking and the book? I would, uh, so... <laughs> I read, I, I've read every EPW issue, I think that's out there. So I want to just tell everyone, read EPW, it's very, it's, it's still, I mean, it's not as great as it used to be, but it's still pretty good. Um, and as a consequence, actually, I used to keep a sense of like, who was doing work in what field. And I'm quite shameless. Uh, that's something that really works for me. So I would just write to people, I would cold call people. I didn't know Professor Jean Drez, I, I didn't work for him under Right to Food. I wrote to him saying like, this is what I'm thinking. What, and, and, you know, People may not immediately respond, but people will respond eventually. People are not, and, and it's not like, uh, no one can do like Sifarish for me to say, oh, like, you know, reply, that, that doesn't work. Um, 
and the other thing i think for me which was very fortunate was i think uh, she's left but our time at the at isst at that time naila kabir ranana jhabwala there were you know these really wonderful feminist statisticians feminist economists who were working in and out of that space in different projects and i happened to be at isst at that time i was a very young person who was immersed into that world at that time and i remember the first draft in fact of the chapter based on rampur which i wrote just the early two years of conversation i had presented it to all people naila kabir along with this group they had a group that would discuss and they were encouraging and they t- tore it to shreds and it was wonderful uh, because you know at, at that young an age you don't really often get that kind of community that will genuinely engage and i'm so grateful which is why everyone is thanked and will profusely be thanked at every event because i owe these women so much and so i think it evolved because i was working at this underfunded think tank uh, which was doing action research projects with these remarkable feminists who were all somehow at that time i think it was an idrc grant that had brought a bunch of them to just come and work on things together and i was a young ra who was just very keen to learn and i absorbed everything and the other was pure cold calling i there are people who i didn't even i don't know who were just i just wrote to saying really economists like for example professor amit basole who now of course you know i i know because we engage on work and all of that but i just wrote to him saying look i want to use this statistic but this statistic is not looking okay to me could you like verify that this is right and he immediately wrote to professor rosa ibrahim who was his co-author they got but this was happening on whatsapp because i got his number from a colleague who was at a conference together so i also think lea part of it is is time right like i had 15 years to do this so obviously i mean it's the privilege of time it's the privilege of being in certain organizations that allows you right to do this and one lesson i actually draw from this i've been i'm about to write actually something about what does this book teach us about field work and the ecosystem of social science research i really think if we set up systems and financing where people can explore alternate narratives as opposed to just the research project that they're sent to do you'll be surprised at the things that happen and you know for all we keep complaining about talk shops and workshops being a waste of money there's a lot of that nonsense that happens with funders one thing i've realized is books like these and several several other texts would not exist had they not been not because of what was being formally discussed at the talk shop but because of everything that was happening at the coffee counter and all of that that is actually the origins of this book are, are those and so i think it's important to invest in those kinds of systems and not just begrudge them because they don't have outcomes immediately right um i think this book is a is an illustration of just the power of that um, but i didn't it's not like it is a lot of cold calling a lot of shamelessness and feminists who were very generous with their time i'll come back to the last point uh, after you read a section from the book you don't right so um um so the kind of surprise that you were talking about that you go in with a research question but you find several other much more interesting things that uh, for those in anthropology sounds very ethnographic but you uh, sort of distance yourself from several disciplines <laughs> including economics and um, also you know ethnography as a method um so the question sort of is the distance and discomfort from the disciplines yeah what has that enabled obviously it has enabled a lot yeah. but w- did that also sort of constrain yeah you know one of the things actually the reason i distance myself is because i know formal academia enough to know that if i claim proximity they'll kick me out like they will enforce the distance and i know it i've experienced it <laughs> like anthropologists would be the first to say this is not an ethnography so i might as well just very clearly say it's not an ethnography this is what i've done i wanted to be as transparent as a soppy yashraj film in its agenda right like just be very clear about what i'm doing what it is doing and then you feel something within that that's wonderful but i the acknowledgments to me were very critical because i wanted to be really really transparent about process timelines who is a composite what is fictional what is not all of that um who gives their name who i really just wanted to be very clear and i i realized with that it no longer becomes an ethnography because there is with ethnography my understanding is based on several friends of mine who are anthropologists is that you require a certain continued sense of immersion which i'm not sure i can claim in these women's lives because i was i was sort of it's a to me in fact the book is a book of glenage more than it is an anthropology because it's like phone calls weddings visits sharok films parties clubs i mean 
you know, this is just sort of the different slices of life, right? And then you can choose to think about it in an analytical framework, which is what I did. Um, so I think that's why I would never call it an ethnography. I owe a lot to the disciplines of anthropology and sociology. To me, this book, I think the closest disciplinary home it has is economic sociology, because those are the fields where people think of the emotional and sociological determinants of economic transactions, which is what this book is, right? That when women work, there's an emotional underpinning of the, econ of the economy and their decisions on employment. And the book gets into that. Uh, there's an emotional underpinning on transactions on consumption. So consumption of a Shah Rukh film, for example, and the book goes into that. So it's, to me, it is a work of economic sociology more than perhaps anything else. Uh, but even there, I think I'm conscious because I don't have a PhD in sociology. I don't belong to like that discipline. I've read it. I mean, I've devoured texts, but I've never studied it formally. So I don't want to sort of, you know, make claims where again, the community will be like, well, but, you know, she's, but she's not part of our community. And so I think it's best, best to be transparent about that. On economics, uh, to be honest, I wrote this book almost as a big, um, I won't use an expletive, but I, like I, I, I was very tired of the way I think a certain kind of economist, particularly in development economics writes about gender. There's a lot of distancing where are this constant question I have when I read like all these papers on RCTs or you know where are you in this? I mean you are there and and why are you not? One thing that I've always admired about the other social sciences is that at least the person you know sometimes I feel anthropology jumps off some self reflexive deep end, but at least in anthropology and sociology the person doing the research is somewhat more present. And economics, in fact, you're rewarded to be absolutely you know you have to abstract yourself away. And I didn't want to do that. And yet this is a book of economics. I mean, to me, it is a book of, I mean, it is blurb by, you know, some wonderful economists and they see it as a work of economics. And I'm grateful that uh, I was able to approach it that way. But I think the reason I was able to approach it that way is because I'm not in an economics department. I don't have to do the, what my friend Amit Varma calls the circle jerk of e econ departments, right? Like there's a certain kind of paper you need to write. There's a certain kind of language, which accrues status. I'm not interested in that game. That's not my scene. And I wrote it the way I wanted to write it. And yet I wrote it rigorously because I do think there is a kind of rigor in, not in data analysis, but in economic theory and frameworks, which is very beautiful. And I wanted really, the book has a lot of economic theory. It actually really has a lot of intra-household bargaining theory. How many people here have studied intra-household bargaining theory yet? Okay, well, one. It's really beautiful. It talks about what happens within the household when people, different people within the home and family earn some money or suddenly step out of the home? What are the sort of game theoretic transactions that are going on within the household? And in a funny way, actually the book is just that. It's a depiction of that drawing very much from the work of Naila Kabir, who's an economist herself. She calls herself a social economist now, which you know, I wonder if maybe that's what I should call myself. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, so for me, I think with the discipline, I wanted to keep a distance from all disciplines because I knew that none of them really housed this. The discipline I hope to cozy up to is economic sociology. So maybe, I don't know, like in my late 50s, I'll do a PhD if they'll have me. Um, but I, I didn't feel constrained. In fact, the reason I walked away from a lot of that, and I was some, I think someone reviewed the book, I think it was in one of the French journals, and they said um, it's unembarrassingly in, interdisciplinary. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have any shame about being that way. And as I said, I'm quite shameless. So I just drew from whatever worked. Um, and I relied on that framework. But to me, I feel like intra-household bargaining was sort of the core theoretic. If you look at the theoretical framework of the book, that is, I think, what it would be, which is actually as much economics, but also a lot of other disciplines because it tends to mix the two. And obviously feminist economics because it's looking at care and the emotion of love and the labor of love, which is important to explore if you're going to talk about women's jobs. So there is a lot of um, secondary data there's a lot of theory written in plain English. <laughs> so how is the shift from, say, the more technical writing that you do in your day job and the writing of this book and shifting between the two, how easy or difficult was that? It was very difficult. Um, I Insomnia is the way I basically dealt with it. I didn't sleep. Uh, because I, I have a very, I have a busy day job. It's not a, it's not a relaxed job at all. And it, it is a job where I work with very type A people. Uh, my clients are often IS officers in government. And if anyone has dealt with government officers, you'll know it's not a, you can't just sort of, you know, say, well, oh, I'll come back later. Often things just have to happen immediately. So it was exhausting. 
but i was so committed i really think this project is just a project of love i was so committed to doing it the women involved were so excited to talk about this actor to complain about the men in their lives to talk about their jobs then i felt like i drew a lot of energy from them honestly i drew a lot of energy from my peers the sort of informal community that i you know was able to at least talk to about the project um but i'm not going to lie it was it was really tiring um and the way i handled it was i basically wrote every night i had this rule that i had to write it, it could be just writing down transcribing conversations it could be re-editing it could be just a line but for 15 years every day i have i have written um and i've done i mean this book has had seven redrafts i mean it's a lot it, it's mad i don't i don't recommend this to anyone by the way but but i i redrafted a lot because i am very particular and i was working with two people also shruti and shogat in particular who were very particular so of the seven drafts three of the redrafts four of the redrafts actually happened in the period between 2019 to 2021 right up till that time because i was just constantly moving i wrote an entire um preface which didn't exist earlier you know things like that um so i i think to i think i don't have a methodological answer to your question i think what i have is very banal things like time management uh write even if it's rubbish every day a uh, kind of diligence and relying i think on the energy of others sometimes to spur you on when you have self doubt when you have i mean because that's in, that's inevitable it's going to happen um and yeah so again i'll just go back to generosity and exhaustion those are my techniques which i don't i mean generosity i i, I highly recommend exhaustion i don't uh, but i was really i really think i was in love i think i was in love with this i i don't know what i'm going to do next because i need to like care about it as much um and i don't know if it's a combination of mr khan along with these women along with economics i think i was in love and i also wanted to um irritate economists uh, so i think it was this combination of things that that created this sort of energy to do it this way and so i wrote every day um there's a lot for all of us to learn from um, not just students who are writing their final projects and struggling with a lot of this but also for us faculty who you know uh, try to write find uh, our writing our own writing dense you know? yeah, yeah i do want to bring in student voice especially um i know there are at least a few who have read the book cover to cover i uh, we can open it up for questions comments um sharing of your own uh, fandom or anything we haven't talked about that at all it's been very good actually no i can hi so um i think you all know i'm an economics major and i think i mentioned that you you had a phd or you you didn't finish it i'm really curious to know why yeah i want to know the story if you yeah no no i um i'm not good enough to do it i just don't have the talent the tenacity there's a kind of i'm not good enough for a phd i'm very good for other things i'm good i'm really really talented to write this book and i'm very good at my job at the world bank and i'm very good if someone asked me to work for a think tank i'd be very good i'd be there are talents that i have and i think it's very important to recognize what makes you happy we come from i think a class of people who have the option to think about these things right we don't have to do things because um uh, one thing that was very important to me was to be perfectly honest i'd finished the mpa id at the kennedy school i come from a, as you know in the book this is a big distinction i come from a salaried family not a propertyed family which is a very important distinction amongst the top 10% of our country and at that time it was very important for me to have an income my father wasn't doing very well health all those things so i knew that i needed to have a job and i thought okay then i'll go back to the phd at some time that didn't really happen because i started enjoying my job too much things in life just happened um and even now i keep thinking well you know should i should i you know throw my hat in but now i know for a fact that that is not a world for me i've seen it actually I, I, most of my friends in fact many of them are in academia um sort of you know like the love of my life was an economist he was a professor and i saw what that business did to him and i saw it's just not for me i knew that i think you i was just this is just it's just me it's completely instinctive it's my it's my set of 
emotional attributes, economic needs, interests, all of that, right? The other thing I will say though is I also think now with the increase in donor funding for different kinds of jobs and development in particular, many jobs don't necessarily need a PhD. And now, in fact, even for data analysis, you can rely on people and programs. And as long as you have a sense of theory and some sense of rigor, I'm very well trained in econometrics. I mean, I know that, I mean, I studied hard. I knew that stuff. I, I know my contract theory. I know all of that. But I felt like that was enough for me to guide others, to guide my own work. Uh, this book draws heavily on a lot of what I've learned. But I think there are jobs that don't necessarily need that. And then there are jobs that do. So if you want to be a poverty economist who measures consumption baskets, as my colleagues do, there you would need it because there are ways of framing, thinking, all of that. But often I also know that it's, it's a signaling device. And I think a PhD signal is important in certain job markets and there are others that don't need it. I seem to currently occupy a space where it doesn't need it right now. Like when I work with government or I was leading, for example, the bank's response to COVID with the Ministry of Finance, nobody ever turned around and said, oh, well, can she lead it? She doesn't have a PhD. No one asks questions like that because you learn by doing in certain jobs. And then the other thing is I didn't want to teach. So I think that's the big thing, right? If you really want to teach, of course, then you need uh, that kind of framing. But having said that, the one thing I will say about academic training is that I really think it's important to know theory very well, be it particularly in economics. In fact, I noticed that there are lots of people who do masters, you learn how to do data analysis. So you're really good with R and Python and you know, like all of that. But economics is actually theory. It's, you know, how are people interacting? How are agents working? Incentives, alignment, all of that. That is actually what guides everyday decision making. And if you look at the really wonderful economists, they are always bringing, they may not actually bring, you look at the work of Professor Jean Dres, for example, many a times it's, it's actually qualitative. But what is he doing? He's actually constantly bringing theory. You'll see it in like the incentive to want to reveal something. You will see the language. There's a way he's doing it, which I think is really magical. And I think really good economists are able to do that. Um, so I think... Actually, not really good economists, but like economics trained people, right? You may not, I wonder, do you need a PhD to be an economist? I'm not sure. Um, and um, so I think to answer your question, if you don't want to teach, and if there's a certain kind of job market you're happy with, and that interests you, then you don't need to do it. Um, but if you do want to teach, and there are certain kinds of jobs, and I think that's a decision you need to make. Um, but there are jobs now in the development space, certainly for economists who don't necessarily come from PhD, but you must learn your theory. I think that's so important. Economists, economics is not statistics. I just really want everyone to know that I, economics is theory. And I think it's really important to learn that well. I'm absolutely loving this conversation. This is what I say in all of my classes that, you know, if I can get you to like theory, maybe love theory 10 years from now, that would be like wonderful. I had one more question. Can I ask? Can we come back? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really have a question per se. Um, I recently, two days ago, decided to start reading. I've not been a big fan of reading. So when ma'am pointed out that kids started reading after Harry Potter and I was struggling to find which book should I start from. And I think I found my first book. So I just wanted to uh, ask, um, how, how would you describe your book in like a few words? So what should I expect as a first uh, book that I'm reading? I think you should expect the emotional underpinnings of why we have such a gender crisis in the economy. Like explaining that using data, qualitative work, um, some relief in pop culture. But to me, it is a book of what are the social and not even social, but like the emotional underpinnings of economic outcomes. Like when we see that, you know, the first page of the book you would have seen is this graph that's dipping for women's employment. It's actually a graph that's very banal. Everyone knows that graph now. I mean, The Economist and The New York Times, everyone has covered it. 
but i really wanted that draft to just come alive in fact i say at the end that you should be crying when you look at that draft because you should realize what how brutal it is to so many women and you should be able to explain it to somebody else be a sharo khan or your grandmother or someone else so i think to me it's it's that it's what's happening to women in the economy and i think sharo because it's the simplest transaction can you just go out and watch a movie you want to it's the simplest economic transaction we can think of and you read the book and you realize how difficult it is for women to just claim that and how the economy functions for women so yeah i realize that's not a few words but can i add to that a little bit <laughs> also um if you're interested in people um stories and um people from very different and very diverse contexts say from a pub in delhi a very elite setting to an agarbatti colony in amdavad um if you're interested in people's lives and hearing about their stories then this book will definitely be of interest i think i'll um get a lot of you know motivation to read other books also then <laughs> i can recommend some later for you surely <laughs> Yep. Uh first Sharan it's a very inspirational book. I know you did it to irritate economists but I for one I'm not irritated at all. <laughs> I find it very inspirational you and relatable. You were the economist I was trying to irritate. I had some very specific ones in mind. <laughs> no I I really think and I uh, I think I've said this before also this idea of not writing in how it's expected to be written in academia I think that makes it more relatable and it reaches out to a lot of people. Um so as you already mentioned that when you started out you didn't really have a concrete plan in mind but as you moved on there was a more formal uh, idea so did you ever have a target audience in mind when you were writing the book uh, because these are women from different strata so so i really hope the book is translated because most of the conversations as you can tell as hindi is a language i'm much more comfortable in as anyone who just met me before may may know um so i'm really hoping i i wrote the book for three people um one i wrote it for the version of myself in my late 20s and early 30s who was really struggling to understand why she was feeling the way she was and really relied on usually western feminists and western economists to explain to me how structures of society and the economy were shaping my love life my loneliness my self esteem my self worth i wanted to do that for some for someone but situated here so that was one so i wrote it for that version of myself which is like any young woman right I wrote it for Shah Rukh Khan. I I did. I I don't. I mean, I definitely did. I wanted him. I really wanted actually for him to understand what's happening to women in the economy. And I think as a sense I have of him is that you know he's always been interested in these issues. And I thought if I wanted to, in, in fact, in him it was more like a litmus test of simplicity, which is that I just thought that would would he get it? And the third person I wrote it for was my grandmother, because I think this idea of not writing it, as I mentioned, she passed around that time, and she really was the one who really opened me up to literature. um and a lot of bangla literature actually but she was really the one who said what are these bengali economists who write only for themselves and the six people you know she'd sort of seen that crowd and she said you know i don't understand what is this writing you know and uh, i i sort of and you know she used to love like the frills and fancy you know fancy free films and those kinds of texts and so i thought let me write it in a way which will also do you know her interest justice so those were the three one of the things i'm realizing now honestly is that men don't read it as much as women uh gay men read it uh I, it's it's actually quite powerful some of the messages i've received from gay men about the text um uh cis het men i think as what like the kids nowadays would call them um, so so there might be a notion that this is an attack on their masculinity no i just i think we're so i you know i it's, it's going to sound terrible but i've been saying this everywhere i just genuinely believe we pretend we're a society where we have a lot of men uh educated elite who pretend to be interested in women's voices but actually are not interested at all so maybe the sales are good like they'll buy it but will they read it i don't know and uh, i'm not sure and then the second thing i've noticed is that there is this instinctive desire to dismiss and it took to be honest amit varma's podcast uh, it took a man essentially to convince a lot of men that oh this book is like about the economy and it's serious right it's not erotic fan fiction i keep joking about that with amit um and most of the reviews have been women uh and gay men uh there was one uh straight man who reviewed it, it was a muslim lawyer who reviewed it for the wire and it's a beautiful review and it really touched me 
and uh, but most of the readership the it's very gendered i and so now what i'm really hoping is as i'm saying everywhere i go just gift it to the most toxic male you know and uh, you know just force them to like sit through like just the actor in aristocrats chapter and then just leave it at that um and you know the funny thing is actually when i go to student events like i was at ashoka and i went to a few other places everywhere i meet young women who get up and they ask, they say this to me they say oh my brother i tried to get him to read it get him to, but they will not engage so it's very it's quite interesting that that is uh, that's something that i'm picking up but i didn't write it for them but i hope that they read it thanks Yeah so I've not read the book so I'm not sure if it if the book covers this part but I was Yeah so I was wondering uh if you've explored what transnational uh, Indians thought about uh, how they considered Shah Rukh Khan No I'm tired of NRI there's so many books about what NRIs think of Shah Rukh I mean I'm not interested if someone else can write it Um I no I in fact that was a very that was a it was a decision I made uh because he is often thought of as this nri hero and the research in the book will tell you that is not true he has a huge constituency in communities that we often think are salman fans but actually women in the households where the boys like salman the women like sharokh um and so that was and and there's actually a lot of academic writing some wonderful writing uh by people like rachel dwyer the people like ananya jahanara kabir if i'm getting her name correct who've written about uh fatima bhutto has a wonderful chapter on him and migration outside the country so i relied i met i used some of that in the book is just sort of you know secondary literature that i cite but it's so well studied and it's so well documented that i really didn't feel that that's something that i would really add anything two and plus remember the book is not about him he is only a lens to talk about you know to what i answered uh, the lady's question it's actually about women in the indian economy um and in and you know society in general but i think particularly the economy and uh, he is just a lens to enter that conversation in a more accessible and in fact in a more open joyous way to have that conversation as opposed to the traditional social science way which can be dire so i i didn't even think of it because number one to me it's not a book about giving you a sense of sharok's fan base that's not the interest in my book at all i'm not interested in that project um and there's also a lot written which is very interesting stuff which you should read so um, Right. So uh, I think you just mentioned that uh, the girls tend to like Shah Rukh Khan and the boys tend to like Salman Khan, right? So I was just wondering that uh, you use the lens of Shah Rukh Khan to en- enter into the, you know, enter into the domain and find out. And I was just wondering that, uh, or thinking out loud, that how would the reactions have been different or qualitatively in a in a in a different direction if the lens would have been another Khan, like you know, Salman or maybe Amir, who's like a little more of kind of an intellectual uh, quote and quote yeah so I, i was just wondering like if you during your field work if you had some kind of an inkling of what the other lenses would have yielded so you know there's a wonderful quote by someone in the book uh, which I'll, let me start with which she says she says i have a very good litmus test for a man in south asia particularly if he's indian pakistani or bangladeshi which is that if he likes sharo he's probably a liberal not 100% but probably if he likes salman he's bad news if he likes amir he's a bearded liberal who likes his own voice too much you know the kind we were saying who pretends to be interested in women's voices but i'm not really sure uh, no i'm i mean that last bit was a bit mean and i take that back but that is what she said right um so no the one thing i want you to know actually is that you know amir didn't come up in low income communities at all it's so dominated by sunny deol like the big action stars um, for the men and for the women at least and remember this is 2006 because i think amir had this sort of resurgence with gajni and all which was a much later period uh, and that was also very urban resurgence um and so it's interesting that i didn't really wherever i went other than elite and upper middle class women i didn't really meet very many women who were like we love amir i met a few but i didn't really meet that many um so that's one and i also want to tell you i think the three of them have very different modes of masculinity right so amir is 
the productive professional, I think conforms much more to the Western idea of what an actor should be. Um, very much notions of, you know, perfection, you know, all of that. Salman is, we know, stoic uh, masculinity, I will beat you up, show of strength. Shah Rukh, I think the one thing I realized talking to film critics and these women who I followed is that one thing that they were all constantly alluding to is he's so obsessed with the gaze of the other. Uh, even if he's playing a bad guy when he's a stalker, robber, terrible things he's doing in those soppy romance films. But in all those films, even with their toxic scripts of like love and gender, it's a lot of dodgy stuff going on. But even with all of that, each one of the women would constantly show me scenes where he's crying because a woman's feelings have made him cry. He's so engaged and not just the lover, but the wife, the, the mother, all of that, right? Um, and the second is women speak much more in his films. And this is something we don't realize I measured it. And it is something that these women were constantly picking up on, that he's engaging with women's needs, he's engaging with women's feelings. You look at an armor film, you take Dangal, for example, which is actually a wonderful film when it comes to women. But women don't talk in it. The narrator is a man. Amir Khan is speaking, right? There's no space for female speech. So what kind of feminist films are we making if like women are not speaking? Pink is the same. Amitabh Bachchan is speaking throughout the film. Um, and I think what's fascinating to me is that, is it really surprising that in that context, in a world where women are constantly told to be so aware of the gaze of the other, that when they see an actor who is suddenly performing that role, he's so worried about the gaze of the other, that women just lap that imagery up, at least these women do. I think the person who I really think is really interesting now, they're all female actors. So when, and I mentioned this in the book that, you know, now when I go to the same sites that I went to, I now see Priyanka, Alia, Karina. like it's all now, suddenly it's the women. And it's, you know, while Shah Rukh represented the benevolent patriarch, you know, a man you want to marry, these women are when you become Shah Rukh, right? Like you are now, you enjoy his success, you have his opportunities, you are as economically successful as he is. I mean, Deepika Padukone actually is now the highest paid star, you know, in the business. And these are things that these young women are very aware of. They see their success. They see them having boyfriends out in open. They see these women talking about their personal lives. So actually the, the set of people who, if anybody ever wanted to do a follow-up, I'm not going to do it. Um, I think that it's actually the women um, where I think the charge now is of, of superstardom. And in the South, it's very different. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to claim to know enough about the South to even pretend to give you an answer. But I think it's very different. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think the Khans, I mean, if I were to now enter into it, and if I accidentally ask people, who do you like? Um, I think in cities, I'll hear, you know, amongst people like us, I'll hear a Rajkumar Rao or I'll hear a Ayushman Khurana, right? But you will notice that almost immediately, it's always like an Alia. It's always one of these. It's not Ranbir. It's not Ranbir. Uh, one of them is in my book, but I won't tell you who. And um, and you'll have to read it. And uh, the the interesting thing is that it's not, I just didn't hear that. I heard much more about the women. So I think the next Khan is a woman. If those on Zoom have any questions, uh, please do put it in the chat box and we can unmute and you can ask. But uh, just to add on to what Shraina was saying, and I see that Nari has her hand up, that a lot of, uh, it, it need not just also be the women, it could also be like K-drama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very, I think that's also very class specific. Definitely. I mean, I, I, if I think of, when I think of Shah Rukh, I think of someone who's an umbrella superstar, right? Like across class, across occupations, across languages. I mean, you can talk to a boatman in Kerala about DDLJ and Dangal, right? That is the power of the Khans. They cross certain boundaries. I don't think K-dramas right now cross those boundaries. I don't. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nari. I'm a social and political science major. And uh, honestly, I want to compliment you for the book first, because like this is perhaps the very first nonfiction book that got me through 100 pages in a day. Like this never happened. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and um, um, like, I absolutely agree with you that there are uh, very few male readers of this book because I observed that in my house. Like, usually my dad is someone who's very interested in books about socioeconomic conditions. 
but this one he didn't ask me a single question about but uh, recently my mom showed me a news highlight and i wanted to ask you about it how was it meeting sharuk it was wonderful um that's all i can say whatever i had to share i put up on instagram i have nothing more to say um it felt like it was a very important milestone in my life and the life of the book and he uh, sharuk for pradhan mantri in my case <laughs> uh thanks for the wonderful conversation we have been having uh so uh, i have two questions so one of the things you said your distance from disciplines and i'm speaking as an anthropologist and you said that uh, people the boundary they would draw is that it's not immersive enough and i felt almost the opposite that it is all more more immersive than we do and the reason being that because you have had these 15 years and you're going back to the same people and talking to them uh so the question is like for us when we write and we have a intensely immersive experience over a period of a year or something and then we are trying to write that reality by the time we write the book we in some ways put a place in in, in a static context because that is the immersive reality which we have understood over those many years and by the time we are writing reality has shifted somewhere so you keep going back to your field you keep going back to these people so was there a sense of having to rethink yourself rethink certain conceptions because things are changing or is it that yeah. depressing graph that things are just going along the same line so uh, so that's my first question um things are depressing when it comes to women in the economy we should just all be depressed um it's not getting any better and uh, you might see post pandemic a slight bump up in women's employment rates but that's because often when there's a crisis you need dual incomes and then uh, we're already seeing then that that gets retracted right like that's just the way the household makes decisions um i think what i did have to change over a long period of time is a couple of things there were uh, there's a type of uh, elite woman that i judged very much you know on my feminist high horse someone who doesn't have a job is a full time carer you know is like letting down the tribe all of that but you know i interviewed a lot of those women who are who love sharukh as much as i do and they see him very differently and there's in particular there's a woman called the rajput philosopher in the book very violent life you know there's so much violence beneath those chiffon sarees that look really you know lovely on the outside but there's it's a tough life and i think i really had to update my priors uh when it came to the way i understood the way they were making decisions that they were working constantly as well and not just saying that in lip service i think a lot of us often say it as lip service but we don't really mean it uh i think for me i have grown to mean it and that's why i'm a big believer now in sort of income transfers for women the way tamil nadu is doing it to reward care labor it just has to be there has to be a way we start to release some of that and reward it recognize it um and so i think that was one prior that shifted and the other prior i think that shifted for me significantly was sharuk i saw him very differently um even in fact 5 years ago or even 2 years ago around the time the ca nrc protests happened and i saw i learned to see him differently from the way all of these women were constructing it like a lot of the things that i used to think were you know that word that toxic and regressive and all of that when some other women in the book explained some of the same scenes to me i started looking at them very differently so i i think yeah i've i've updated my priors i think on the way some women occupy the labor market and also i think the icon right and his imagery so the rajput woman she uh uh so you said you had to remove people and she agreed to this she seems to be somebody who would be easily identifiable so what's the if you can speak she's about not, that story we work no? very hard to make sure she's not <laughs> there are things that have been done which i i i mentioned right up in the acknowledgments she made edits and, and the different changes um i also felt that honestly you know something i noticed a lot of the women i was speaking to were saying to me was that no one ever asked people about what gives them pleasure so for example even manju who is this young embroidery worker in um rural rampur in up she told me she said often when people come from big cities they just want to know okay like tell us about poverty deprivation labor rights being violated this is a very rigid framework or they come to ask about election results 
right like who are you voting for exit polls all the very rigid frameworks with which the elite who have education and the social science community tends to approach people who are not as empowered as us right who are the ones we study and she actually told me she said no one's ever asked me i mentioned this no one's ever asked me about my favorite actor before and she was so surprised that this was something that i was at all even interested in talking to her about it opened up this space it was this sort of shift and i think it's the same and i think with the rajput philosopher i think that that conversation strangely enough i also think that just gave her almost more interest to own her own story to see herself as a fairly agentic being as opposed to just someone in a loveless marriage um and so yeah she participated she and but she's not identified but although i'll tell you a funny story the person who is i think the closest and and we've again worked hard to make sure he's not is my ex uh because uh, often i go to events and people always want to ask me like is it this person is it that person and i can assure you they are very well protected because otherwise it's not possible right and i shared it with him and it's some it was a hard thing to do but I think, in fact, it's some of the men who are more identifiable in my book uh, than the women. Hmm? Is that subconscious? I don't know, but I'm glad that I sent it. I had to send it to them; otherwise, I would not clear my protocols or all of that. So I'm grateful for that, um, and I'm very grateful to them. I'm very grateful to my ex. Uh, um thank you so much rena i can't get enough of uh, hearing you I, i've now heard you four or five times talking and and you always bring out new facets on on the process behind writing the book and by the way i today i feel like a museum curiosity i'm a male reader of your book <laughs> so uh, uh this is more like a process question which as leia started the conversation about the process and you explained how uh i'm a market researcher by profession and i've been doing consumer market research and in quantitative market research as you said we draw the median portrait or like a pen portrait we have talked to 500 people and instead of showing an excel sheet with 500 sets of data we create a pen portrait and brings the consumer to life uh, and quantitative people do that like data journalist like rukmini in her book uh, a whole truths and um, uh, whole numbers and half truths she brings she talks of really big data like census and nss and all that and and then brings out a real human being to kind of illustrate that so in quantitative i can understand kind of median medianizing the the data but in where you were saying you've kind of made composites out of 3 4 5 people how as a process how does that work uh, don't you see those three or four people in your mind all the time yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so and how- in fact originally i wanted to write them as three or four there were five people who are in the first chapter this is the first chapter in the first part of the book the elite composite chapter was always going to be a median so there are actually i actually collected quantitative data on which was the first shark film you saw where did you see it it's easier to and it's really interesting there are very common patterns i realized um and the sample was drawn from snowballing it's not a representative sample in any way although economists now increasingly are obsessed with snowballing because they say like the variance introduced uh, because of snowballing then ends up actually approximating sometimes to very carefully sampled data as well so anyway but that's open for debate doesn't matter i'm not claiming there is it's snowballed but those 80 women from all over which are in the elite composite those are like data attributes you know how did you first see him and then there are some stories that i use sometimes to just make some of the data come alive from different places the five women um who all uh, have had foreign boyfriends and have uh, have felt very dejected by them this was the one thing that was common amongst all of them originally i had written them as different people and then some of them started to feel that nahi you know nahi hoga ye wo so we sat together it was like a focus group and we said okay so what do you feel what can we do and then some of the things they said can we remove this can we remove this and so i wrote it based on that um which is why i say it's a fictional composite and i'm very transparent about that it's fictional but it's based on one of them did go and cry in front of a sharok statue um at madam tussauds giving it away uh one of them actually all of them were in a hotel room feeling very sad about the fact that they had been unceremoniously dumped 
all of them were feeling quite dejected about the lack of emotional vocabulary that many of the men in their lives exhibited many of them were feeling out of the five four were complaining that this was because of foreignness and uh, western modernity and western masculinity and sharuk is different and all of them were blaming sharuk so in a way it, it was easier to do because the patterns were so similar but originally when i wanted to write them as five different women i actually wanted to talk a bit more about their jobs because each of them works in fairly high powered corporate spaces and those spaces are quite difficult for women to occupy and i wanted to talk a little bit about that it was difficult and yet the fact that they really enjoyed their jobs so i collapsed that which is right up in the beginning that you know she loves her job um and what the job really means to her as a sense of identity uh but it was a collaborative process and that's basically i used an fgd and we just sort of said let's decide and we looked at patterns and they spent an hour with me and at the end of it i sent it to all of them uh it took me two months to write <laughs> which is hard and then yeah that's that's what it is i think we have a couple of questions online and questions hello yeah i'm sonal and thank you for that conversation am i audible yes or no yeah thank you uh, ms pattacharya and uh, leya so my question is little bit off bit so if we talk about women then if uh, the enrollment of women in higher education has increased and it's uh, almost equal second thing is that if you quote india skill report which also says that more women are employable compared to men uh, third is that now you know women has right to uh, you know claim for their property uh so looking at all these how do you rate women i mean uh they are becoming you know to some extent financially stronger uh or they are not i mean you know another uh, way if you look at so yesterday's you know uh, the news which claims that 900 million people have stopped looking for job and we in economics we call it you know discouraged workers where women you know the proportion of women is higher so i mean what are those key factors which are yeah uh, yeah okay Thank so a couple of things the three things that you mentioned so for example the property rights and in fact i get into into the book it is incredibly hard because in fact if you look at people who are studying feminist lawyers and jurisprudence around the use of that property rights clause what's happening is this constant this gift giving happening from brother from sisters to brothers there's a lot of this so i think i chalk a lot of this stuff and i'm not going to get into the india skill report because there are people who sort of critiqued and i'll just send you the links of those i think a lot of this is in the realm of lip service and it looks nice but it has no if you look at look at the current cmie data amongst the richest 20% 6.5% of married women have a job um and cmi has a diff- and nf and it's not like the plfs is providing us anything better i mean it's is just getting worse and worse right um and i i trust those data sets because they're consistent they're longitudinal they're constantly tracking in time as well right so so it's it's quite we should be very worried i think a couple of things are happening in fact what you mentioned about education so there are five families of effects that are explaining and i get into this in the book uh that are explaining what's happening to women in the labor force one is actually a more hopeful um effect which is the education effect which is because women are studying for longer the initial ad hoc jobs that they would have done at a younger age they're no longer doing so they just study and then they get married and of course marriage and motherhood always kick women out of the labor force that's just you know it's a the ILO the world bank so many organizations are showing this that there are norms around that so that's one second is care we all know about care labor uh, we are in the bottom five when it comes to men helping in housework uh which is probably why no one wants to no man wants to read my book um and uh, there is no renegotiation happening even when women are working and women are not working um and india is not one of the highest spenders on care infrastructure either uh, e- either be it subsidizing appliances or you know making it easier for women to manage that work mm-hmm. the third is um and this is interesting it's the income effect uh which essentially says that as households in- incomes go up families are able to purchase more conservative values so similar you know trends as like sex selective abortion at a point of time we're not seeing it at scale similarly but essentially the idea is that 
um, and, and this ties to what sociologists call the Sanskritization effect, which is that households want to mirror upper caste rituals where you want to protect the purity of the woman's body because of caste norms. So if the household can afford to work just on one income, which it could, right, post-liberalization incomes boom. You'll see it in the book. Everyone's incomes have boomed um, mm-hmm. in the households that I follow. The family decides it's better for the woman to just stay at home. Uh, and there's some part of socialization as well. It's not that the family is forcing the woman to withdraw. It's just many a time many women themselves are socialized to believe a job is not core to their identity. Marriage and motherhood are. So this is a choice that they make. Um, the, and the last effect, which I think is really interesting, which I really think now economists, I know people like Ashwini Deshpande, lots of people are really getting into and studying very closely, is that actually if you look at the sectors that have grown in India post-liberalization, in the top 10 fastest growing sectors, less than 19% of jobs are for women. And so the way, the nature of the growth, so look at the sectors, construction, retail, transport, these are all sectors that require mobility. They require dealing with strangers. They require constantly being outside the house. These are jobs that women just are not able to take up and men have benefited. So in fact, I say in the book that liberalization has basically been for men. Women are still waiting for liberalization. Um, And the other interesting thing is that I think a lot of now, I think the focus needs to be not on, I mean, of course, social norms, yes. Um, But actually thinking about how do we set up incentives in the private sector to start to train, hire, recruit, sustain women's employment? How do we look at the growth path of India in such a way where there are sectors where women can also participate? So for example, 64% of women in manufacturing work from home. And yet, if you look at the government's employment policies or anytime, if you look at a lot of the labor policies, the home is yet to be acknowledged as a workplace. And yet Mm -hmm. most of our garments, so much of that work is not coming from SCZs. We are not Bangladesh. We're far from Bangladesh. Most Mm -hmm. of it is actually still happening in ad hoc ways within the home. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's there. I think it's actually in the private sector where a lot of focus perhaps needs to be. And, and, you know, I'm hopeful, um, particularly because I see state governments trying to do a lot. Um, And the last thing I will say to you, and I think this is the puzzle, right, of when you look at what's happened to gender relations post-liberalization is that, and I say this in the book, for many women, it's so onerous being in the workplace. The office is like full of its bro codes and it's sort of, you know, there's a lot of nonsense that I think women have to deal with in their workplaces, Uh, be it harassment, be it abuse, be it labor relations, be it just what's happening in the space, feeling like your work is not recognized, all that stuff, right? Plus you're handling the care burden. And so it's almost like we're setting up incentives for women to just want to withdraw. I mean, even the most career-minded woman, and there are are cases like this in the book, will eventually withdraw because it's just too onerous to stay out of the home in the paid workforce. And what I really wish we should retire, and I really, I mean, this is something I keep saying, is that stop looking at like heads of banks and CEOs to say, oh, like women are so economically empowered. Look at the CMIE data and look at PLFS instead. Um, We should retire CEO feminism. It's wonderful that these women have achieved what they have and they are really remarkable women, but they represent essentially such a tiny pool of what is happening. Women in the media, and I get into numbers and this in the book, just because, you know, often many people used to say to me, well, women are in the media, they're on radio and TV all the time. So doesn't this mean that women are empowered? Perhaps maybe women have more voice. Maybe women have more access to media and communication devices. But yet India has one of the largest global gaps when it comes to communication, right? Um, And we are now bottom five when it comes to women's economic freedoms. And so despite that, these are very small enclaves and the larger country out there is perhaps a set of women who may almost be incentivized not to work, Mm -hmm. uh, not to do paid work. I want to clarify that because I feel women are working all the time. And then I think the corollary to that is, can we reward care work? So I think it's a really complex set of dynamics that are playing out in the economy and society. And the book tries to give you a flavor of those. But I do think we have to acknowledge that unless we renegotiate care and invest in care in a credible way, reward women's care labor and start to address a lot of the toxic nature and the weak uh, acknowledgement to women's labor, even in the workplace, a lot of Hmm. women may just say, well, you know what, if I have a husband who has, you know, this is the other discouraged workers effect, right? That if you have a dual income and the husband is earning enough, I'll just drop out. And you see that. And of course, I think the other area which requires sustained emphasis is looking at, I'm, I'm a believer in affirmative action when it comes to women in certain jobs. 
uh, just that is what will start to shift social norms. I think it's actually the private sector and the the agencies that are the employers, and it's very much the demand side. We often just talk about the supply side, which is the household and the decisions it makes. But actually, I feel the the conversation now needs to shift to the demand side and look at firms and enterprises. How can we hire more women? How can we incentivize through taxes, through incentives, different ways, the private sector to actually just engage more women in talent? And the last thing is a very long answer. I realize is that none of this is going to happen unless the housing market and the transport market don't change, because mm-hmm. most jobs in India are still concentrated in certain cities and areas and agglomerations. And if you're not able to travel to work, how are you going to take up a job? Uh, as a single woman living in like ni- the nicest parts of Delhi, I can tell you it is hell to find a house on your own and mm-hmm. to live on your own. Uh, anyone who's had to live on their own as a single woman knows what I'm talking about. Until you don't start to attack some of these ancillary markets, um, we are going to have these SEZ type of employment relations where actually the, the person who's the agent bringing these women into the workforce essentially is a benevolent patriarch, is behaving exactly the way you know a strict dictator would within the family. And we will see these very puzzling trends. So yeah, that's but but there's a lot of this in the book. And I think there's some very interesting work, particularly coming out now uh, of Ashoka. Uh, looking at uh, women's employment, looking at much more the demand side, which I think is going to be very interesting. Right. Thank you so much for that uh, interesting you know, insight. Uh, Thanks, Sonal. I think we may have time for one last question if anybody has this. So thank you very much, first of all, writing for this book. Uh, there are multiple characters in the book. So I love uh, Zahira and Manju's story. So I, w- I want to know who is your favorite uh, character or uh, are you in touch with Zahira, Minal, Manju? Manju? Yeah. yeah, I am in touch. I might do something 10 years down the line. Let's see. Um, uh, we were all very much in touch. It's like a longitudinal friendship for, for life. Um, they're very well. Uh, Minal is not married, Zahira's daughter. There's a lot in the book about her marriage. She's still not married. She's working. Um, and my favorite, I don't have a favorite. Um, they're all just so wonderful. Um, and yeah, I don't have a favorite, but thank you. Thank you. I'm glad the character spoke to you. Uh, So I'm just going to take a step towards the female fandom and ask you a question there. Um, So you already have mentioned um, how this, uh, you know, how women are looking towards uh, female actors now uh, as, as, you know, role models in that sense. But taking a step back towards the past, do you think the qualities and values that maybe SRK embodies today could be seen in some of the earlier generation stars like maybe Devananda, Raj Kapoor. I mean, I understand that the the generation of audience was very different and their mindset was very different. But um, could you maybe yeah. sort of predict if they had similar qualities that uh, the, you know, the women could look forward to or look up to in that sense? Um, I'm sure. But I think the really significant shift between all of them and Mr. Khan is the economic liberalization and telecom reform. Because you must remember that all these actors, even if they played men, number one, you must first, most Indians are not watching films. I mean, if you look at the NFHS data, you realize it's actually they're interacting with songs, they're interacting with snippets now on the mobile phone, earlier on the radio, back at the time that you're speaking of. And once in a year during a festival, right, you would, during Eid or Diwali, you would go out and watch a film, which by the way, if you read the book, you'll see that that is actually a trend that still holds. I think the last NFHS number on this is it's 8% of women report watching a film in the last month. So we are part of an 8%. I think we should just remember that, right? And men's is higher. It comes to like, I think it's somewhere in the 20s. It's in the book, these statistics. Um, So foregrounding it with the fact that most are not interacting with full length films. I'm sure the ones that are uh, the the sort of people who have the wealth, the free time. And also the other thing is it's very gendered, right? Because six out of 10 people in a cinema hall are men. Uh, There's again, data from Ormax on this. And so given that the film space is so gendered and given that most of the country is not watching these films, you may be right that there might be a small elite that could find similar, you know, considerate masculinity 
like characteristics in a Raj Kapoor, Devanand, some roles that even Dharminder did actually for that matter. But I think the real shift is that post-1992, when we all had satellite TV, and suddenly even the shop in a rural village had the TV playing, right? You could see Shah Rukh's interviews. Those interviews on DD, those interviews on the first private network, Star TV, those interviews are burned in people's mind. They may not even understand what he was saying, but they have seen him. And many of them say things like, well, I learned the word middle class from him because, you know, he, they would not understand many of the words because, you know, he would use a mix of English and Hindi when he would speak. And he would actually speak a lot in English. But people kept hearing that word middle class and they discussed it amongst themselves. And then some of the women actually said that that is how they understood that Shah Rukh Khan is middle class. Like, what does that mean? Right. What does it mean to be like, is middle class only from Delhi? Like, what, what, what does that mean? Right. Um, and so I think to me, the reason the fandom is different, and I suspect this is true now with the Internet, right, and the proliferation of images on phones, on laptops and all of that and on social media. Um, is that the intimacy that he had with us to share, even if it's a performance, right? Like he used to talk about making toilets for women. I don't know if you remember this, but this is in 1994 before like feminism became trendy, right? And um, he was talking about these things. Then so many of the women who were working appreciated that so much. And, you know, there's a domestic worker in my book who said that, yeah, like we don't get to use toilets. So, you know, there are associations that were possible because suddenly the TV was everywhere. Satellite networks allowed for this. They needed content. And he was such a great foil to that, right? Because he used to give a lot of interviews. And a lot of journalists I spoke to, they said, you know, he was everyone's dream to interview because he would always give you like some quote, right? Something. Um, and so I think the difference to me between the previous generation, and I really think he is the marker of this. He is very much an embodiment of liberalization, market reform, and telecom reform at that time. And it's interesting now that the economy is tanking, his career has also been struggling, right? Like, I think there's a very interesting parallel there. But, but that is the difference. The fact that he was so much more intimate. And, you know, people know things about his family that I don't think anyone knew at that time about a Devanand because they wouldn't, number one, they wouldn't share. And number two, they didn't have the platform to share, right? Um, and so I think that is, to me, that's the shift. Thank you so much. This was a brilliant conversation. Thank you. So we can continue the conversation, but we have to end it for official purposes. Uh, I'm Sutismita Das, uh, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts and Sciences. So uh, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Shrayana, for this uh, wonderful talk. You weave in so uh, deftly economic theory, economic uh, data, and an anthropology of desire, of media, all of these different genres. And we have had such an enlightening conversation over here. So thank you. Uh, and thank you to everybody for joining us in class offline uh, and online. And I do hope you will continue supporting the uh, lecture series and come for future talks as well. Uh, so thank you. And thank you to Leah and to you. Thank you. And thank you to uh -huh. all of you for being here. Thanks. <laughs>